Um, so I would like to, uh, to, to invite my panelists to come on stage. Actually, so um, we're supposed to sit, the panelists are supposed to sit in the, um, the red chairs, and the little bit wider chair at the end is mine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. Think, but okay. um, so Eric, maybe um, if you want to take, I don't have anything to do with Eric anymore, I think, uh, by now. Um, but guys, just wait for a moment so I can introduce you. He's the Director of Business Development at ATP Innovations. He's also um, co-founder of Sydney Angels, um, obviously uh, very well known in the, uh, in the investment circuits uh, around here. Um, then Francis, you're allowed to call. <laughs> um, well, Francis, already you know, he's the Technology Director for Aid Security. He's a very long history in actually working at banks and exchanges. Um, and then I would like to introduce Nathan uh, Brumby, uh, who is the CEO of Tepitude.com, and I'm really proud that uh, Nathan's willing to join us today. Um, I, I really like the company Tepitude.com, and I think uh, soon we will ask uh, Nathan to actually give us a bit of an introduction in the company. Um, it's part of a group of new thinking companies that are really looking at how to use software to enrich your life, and in this case, uh, make life of employees and employers better. Um, and last but not least, Stuart. Um, he is... Uh, um, well, well known in the incubator, accelerator kind of world, um, definitely from Melbourne on some hands. Uh, very gracefully also uh, uh, has uh, made available to us in Melbourne this afternoon the York uh, Butter Factory where we actually streaming this one live to. Um, I think uh, there's a great, a great panel to actually ask some, some questions to. Um, use, either use Twitter or if there's not many two questions coming in over Twitter, you'll, you can raise your hands, things like that. I have a few questions to start the story off with, um, uh, but we'll, we'll actually keep it uh, in, as interactive as possible. Nathan, um, I just told everybody what I love about Deputy.com, so maybe, maybe if you can move the microphone up there, um, Nathan, if you could just start off, just explain a little bit what Deputy did promise. I think you deserve some, uh, some attention for that. Thank you. So, uh, essentially, what we're all about is um, using technology to have a far better interaction between employers and employers, uh, particularly in a decentralised <coughs> workforce where the notion of where you need to be, what you need to do, uh, what you need to know is critically important. Can you guys hear this? Actually. If so, you should have actually waved your hands more violently because you wanted to hear. Yeah. Can we can you speak up or actually can we turn on the, uh, the sound? Can we hear that? Yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah, so, I, okay, that's better. Um, so essentially what we're all about is just using technology to have a better interaction between employees and employers in decentralized workforces. Um, and I guess what the thinking is, I have, a, I have children, I have a 12 year old daughter her whole world is her iPhone and Facebook and Skype. And there's a couple of interesting things. One is she doesn't ever believe she has to own anything. Books and music and computer games. The second thing is she has immediacy of gratification. She wants to know something about her social network. She immediately gets it. And when we send her off to work as a part-time job, probably in a cafe, she'll expect the same experience. She'll expect to get an iPhone, hit a button, know when she needs to work, know who she's working with, know what she needs to do, expect feedback from the management that she's done a good job or otherwise, and know what's actually going on. So our business is all about leveraging Amazon. We're completely an Amazon shop. Allows us to go anywhere in the world. But it's all about going into business as diverse as a mechanical engineering business, to a pizza chain, to a cafe franchise, uh, to retirement homes, anywhere where people don't necessarily sit in an office each day. So that's our business. Thanks, uh, Nathan. Um, I, I made the joke earlier on, Stuart, about you know, accelerators versus incubators. Um, first of all, tell us a bit about what you're thinking are. Why, why, why are these things so different and, and what's important and different about it? Uh, and can you give us a bit of insight in uh, how, how the extradium, let's say, incubator says accelerator landscape looks like and, and what, what the important role is that they play? Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess incubation and accelerator is always a, a hot topic, and we've uh, we've obviously got uh, quite a few that uh, that are coming online here in uh, here in Australia, and, uh, and and quite a spectrum of offerings as well, from uh, from Sydney to Melbourne to to Adelaide to 
in our River City Labs in uh, in, in Brisbane, or uh, or the York Butter Factory, say in Melbourne, where we're, uh, where we've uh, rather than go the incubator and accelerator route, that just went co-working and uh, and really driving the collaboration and learning between startups as a, as a, as a focal point. Um, you know, there's obviously a, n a nice amount of rivalry which exists, and uh, and I think that rivalry is really now extending into the uh, to the battle for what is finite amount of capital that, uh, that exists here in the Australian uh, ecosystem. So for us, what we've been really focusing on uh, as a venture capital is building out that ecosystem and, and making sure the, the infrastructure is in place uh, so that we, I guess, can, can see uh, on, a, I guess, a higher probability basis and a low cost of sales basis uh, more of the, 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 the fantastic deals that are uh, in the Australian ecosystem. So, you know, the ecosystem that we've got is, uh, is, is one of conservatism in terms of uh, investors out there. Uh, we, uh, we are capital constrained. Uh, you know, what we've got is, uh, is I guess, a, uh, an intellectually uh, rich uh, ecosystem, but uh, our ability to convert that at the moment is, is quite low. So you know, what we've been really doing is, is, is applying as, uh, as venture capital a lot of the lean startup principles to, uh, to identify you know, where are the opportunities existing in Australia, how can we actually capitalise on, uh, on, on what we've got, and, uh, and, and really taking that step forward. So from the grassroots, there's things like Silicon Beach Drinks, which operate here in Sydney, but also in Melbourne. Uh, we've got things like Startup Weekend, which is uh, run by the Kaufman Foundation. We then move up, move along the spectrum to essentially things like Aurelius Digital, an angel investment network in Melbourne and also in Perth, uh, equivalents in Innovation Bay in Sydney. Uh, where angel investment is now starting to actually occur. So you can see that we're starting to get this flow and we've got increased activity and now we're starting to see increased uh, results. So hopefully the, the certainty can really start to increase. Um, you know, we started investing in, uh, in January of, uh, of 2011 uh, and we, uh, we jumped out of the blocks quick. We, uh, we did eight investments and, and certainly intend to, to continue at a, at a reasonable uh, rate of knots. Um, so the activity is definitely picking up, but you know, the opportunity that we see is, uh, is that we've got uh, you know, a, a about 18 months uh, lag time before essentially what's happening in the US actually happens here. So Australia is really a great place for, for I guess, uh, for companies to, to start, to grow, to leverage uh, some great intellectual capital, and then to, uh, to also uh, make, a, uh, make a jump into global markets using the principles such as, uh, as, as the lean startup and uh, variable costs such as that offered by the Amazon uh, Web Services. Uh, interesting actually that you, uh, early on when you say, you talk about the advantages of, of let's say the accelerator or the co-working setup, and one of the things that you mentioned is, is the learning effect. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Eric also em emphasized learning. Um, is it hard for some accelerators or for, for some, let's say, folks that oversee these startups to really consider learning as being the right outcome of a, of, of a business instead of actually you capitalizing on your money? Yeah, look, I think that that's, a, that's an extremely good question. I guess, uh, you know, I guess hands up any investor who wants somebody, well, I guess, learning on their money. Um, you know, that's obviously uh, you know, one of those things that uh, you're obviously not going to stand up there and actually say in front of, a, front of an investor or in a board meeting if you've, uh, if you've been successful in sourcing uh, investment. But I guess the key thing is, is, is those learnings and the collaboration which is now starting to occur across the community uh, that is, you know, is, is giving, I guess, you know, the Australian ecosystem some semblance of the success factors that, uh, that are driving the likes of the, the Silicon Valley. So, you know, it, it is the collaboration that occurs, it's the mentorship, it's the, it's the people that have actually had the experience of growing an entrepreneurial business that are now giving back, that's, uh, that's really making, uh, making a difference and, and seeing that, uh, you know, the Australian market, despite really, really low levels of capital, uh, is starting to gain, uh, gain a level of traction. Um, maybe, Andrew, maybe we can follow up on, on this one. Uh, one of the things that Stuart mentioned was going global. Um, is, is that in this, do you feel that, I mean, you're an early stage investor, uh, at least at one part of your business is early stage. Um, do you really see, do you really pick, pick companies that, that, oh, that have sort of that, that DNA already in them that they can go global? Or is, is a focus really, is, can, can companies succeed just in the Australian market? I mean, it very much depends on the type of business. So there are businesses within Australia that have both enough market reach and enough acquirers to make it viable in Australia. I think we all look to the Valley as the mecca for startups. Um, but one of the changes that's occurring um, 
particularly with a cell, but some of the corporates starting to invest in Australia, is that they are showing that businesses can be built in Australia with global reach. So that um, Alassian, 99 Designs, Tiger Spike, there's a whole lot in the last couple of years that have been invested from, I mean, what we would rate as serious investors from a US perspective. And it's, it's given a lot of validity to the businesses in Australia so they can build and grow and, and maintain their headquarters here, but they're credible on the international scene. So it's, an, it's actually a really important change from them reaching out, but also from the local investors seeing that there's a path for them too in terms of bigger amounts of capital, which... But, but on the other, companies like freelancer.com, realestate.com, Seek, others, locally listed companies, um, I mean, you can build a very successful business just targeting the Australian market. Absolutely. There are some, you know, group buying, classifieds. Yeah. There's a whole lot of markets that you can build just locally. But, but there are also, you know, the, a startup needs to find its niche. And in order to do that, it may need to reach globally. And, and so that opportunity, I mean, it's not just that. It's, it's also being an Australian company that can sell. Because one of, one of our challenges is disappearing overseas. So the companies and the people... <laughs> leaving Australia and actually leaving a void here. And, and, and actually what we're finding now, and particularly like Startmate, um, one of our most effective, most successful accelerators, um, second round now, they pitched today at 500 startups in the Valley. Um, it would have been a couple of hours ago, I think now. And the whole mentor team are all Australian. Some of them are living in there, over there, and some of them are living here. But actually it's been a very effective um, collaboration between the two groups and they're absolutely driving that connection into the valley and some of those businesses will stay but a whole bunch will come back here and, and maintain a business that probably covers both both territories. Are, are there unique uh, sides to let's say uh, being a VC in Australia versus the rest of the world or, or maybe even uh, VCs here and VCs let's say in the rest of Asia given that we're streaming this uh, around the region um, are, are, are there particular differences or, or is actually just investing, just investing? So, I mean, traditionally in Australia, there hasn't been big funds. So the smaller investors have, have moved themselves up the value chain. And so Angel is going into businesses that have got revenue and customers. So there's some proof that um, they're going to make it in the, in the world. So the smaller funds in Australia have moved further up and are investing in businesses uh, that otherwise would have traditionally been um, for the in other parts of the ecosystem. So now that Excel's coming to Australia, we've actually got at least the big guys there. And it might mean too that the local, there's a lot of money in Australia in, within the superannuation funds to put into PE and venture, potentially. So it's now proving that there is actually a market, an investment market in Australia, and therefore um, more money will hopefully come into the space. Um, so it's actually coming, uh, this going a bit on on the, on the sort of the cultural differences. Eric, you, you, you basically, um, evangelize, let's call it like that, a, um, uh, a set of learnings. Um, how much of those learnings, you know, while, while you're now traveling around the world, how much of those learnings are actually unique American learnings? Um, are all of your lessons purely, easily transplantable into other cultures? Um, you know, is, is the idea, I think, you know, some of the core of your ideas are in the accounting piece of it. You know, really being able to drive for, for a minimal viable product, uh, get early. Is that something that is just acceptable for business world to build, right? Well, I certainly think so, you know, because I travel around the world and talk to people about doing it. So, you know, better be. Look, when I first started doing this, I, had, I actually didn't know. You know, the first time I traveled outside the country, outside of America, to talk about this, I often met audiences that were very skeptical that said, look, Obvious, you know, sure, in America, you could just like walk down the street and brag about what a failure you are and everyone thinks it's great, but in our country, that's, you know, that's not, that's frowned upon. It can ruin your career, it could bankruptcy laws. I mean, I, I've been, you know, some, some places really have quite, uh, quite serious public policy challenges. But um, first of all, you know, I, I feel like people basically consume information now about Silicon Valley as if it was a reality TV show. But it's not. Those are real people, and they're marketing to you. It's, it's a message that we put out about how great Silicon Valley it is so that if you ever have any successful companies, you will send them to us. Uh, so we love, I mean, listen, I got, no, I got no beef with that. I live in San Francisco for a reason. I do think it's an amazing place to live. But uh, it is not, the grass is not as greener as we make it out to be. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of serious uh, academic research where people have studied 
what makes Silicon Valley and places like it successful so that those elements can be replicated. And the challenge is that um, the recommendations of that research are just not very exciting. You can't, it's not like you, if you build a stadium, then you'll be fine. It's not like big infrastructure that you need. It's very soft cultural factors. It has to do with uh, being open to failure. It has to do with allowing people to move and share ideas across firm boundaries and, and stuff that doesn't get public policymakers that excited. But the reason that I'm especially skeptical of the idea that any specific business methodology has cultural roots uh, is that that was such a big issue with lean manufacturing. Uh, especially in the United States, in the 80s and 90s, there was this big thing about Toyota and the Japanese, you know, destroying American manufacturing, and there was a lot of scaremongering about it. And, and the very easy explanation for how come uh, Japanese companies and American companies who make the exact same product, they're better at it than we are, you know, well, it's easy to do that. Like, people made all these crazy, you know, uh, interpretations about, oh, it has to do with Zen Buddhism, and it has to do with the Japanese culture of this, and, you know, just whatever, like, excuse we could find, like, well, they're different from us, so it's, you know, unique to that culture. And those uh, explanations were thoroughly and completely debunked. In fact, uh, Toyota now, I think, operates as many factories in the United States as it does in Japan, and, and has uh, the same level of reliability and quality using the Toyota production system in America. And if you read a book, there's a great new book that just came out uh, from the same people that wrote the Toyota Way about how that translation was done. It's not that everything is exactly the same in America that it was in Japan for Toyota. It's that if you understand the underlying principles, you can then figure out how to translate them to your unique circumstance. And I think that same lesson really applies when we're talking about developing startup hubs and ecosystems. The information about the principles of how to create uh, entrepreneurial hubs is out there, but what I would urge you to do is instead of spending your time thinking about all the great things that you heard supposedly Silicon Valley has, instead try to think about what are the strengths that we have and then how do we translate those strengths, combine them with these principles that we've learned about you know, from all these other regions uh, to invest locally and, and build the best hub that we can. So actually, uh, coming on to the strength meeting, Francis, maybe you can, maybe you can comment on that. You guys are, are clearly a very diverse uh, group of people that come together in a um, maybe a somewhat hostile environment. That's right. Yeah, um, uh, that's that's a big risk. Um, so 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 how does the diversity there actually helps you guys be successful? Um, uh, as you said, it's uh, you, you know we are operating in an hostile environment, uh, but uh, it's it's you know we are we are a fully regulated business, and um, as uh, Eric said earlier. Um, um, being lean is not about um, is not about you know the type of environment you are operating in. So for us, um, having this uh, variety of skills and experience, and um, uh, was, was 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 great to get started. And then with the tools uh, that we had at our disposal with uh, with AWS, we were able to make uh, to make a huge difference. Um, I talked earlier during the presentation about the cost saving that we uh, that we are able to make every day. Um, that, 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 that's good, but um, the other element that is really important for us is the peace of mind, um, knowing that uh, we have today um, um, everything we need uh, for the future as well. So that's, for us, that's, that's a key element. So the focus, the team and the management team and everybody in the company can focus on actually generating value and not worrying about, about anything else. So, uh, and through diversity of experience, uh, we can actually uh, boost uh, boost uh, the, the business. So, do you actually have a pivot meeting planned? Oh, sorry. Do you have a pivot meeting planned? Um, <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, myself, <laughs> I, you, know. you don't have to answer that one. Actually. Um, so, uh, given that we have we have about 15 minutes, is there anybody? I, I can keep on asking questions, but is there anybody in the audience that have a has a, a question that you would like to answer? Uh, have answered. Um, there's someone with a microphone running down to you right now. Uh, Nathan, I'm interested in uh, deputy.com. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, how the employer is represented rather than the employee? Yeah, so I, I think a big thing, as I said, is, is people want to be connected, and, and that's one thing social media has taught us. You, you, you go to work, whatever it is, it's part of your life, you want to feel part about it. Uh, in deputy, from the employer's side of it, 
you do want to be connected to your employees. Uh, you do want to be able to identify talent. You do want to be able to manage them. You do want them representing your brand, et cetera. So on the employer side, there's a lot of value in having the right people, knowing what they're doing. And I'm talking specifically into centralised workforces. Um, knowing what they're doing, being able to communicate with them, uh, and being connected to them. You know, one of the things that I think is really interesting is we're still solving basic problems. And if we talk about infrastructure or we talk about applications, there's a ruthless simplicity that ultimately presents itself. And I sit and listen about, you know, Amazon, and, and I come from an infrastructure management background, and I can tell you it was very complicated. And now we just go and pay a check each month <laughs> and we get a really quality service. In deputy, it's the same thing. There are basic problems or basic challenges in how people do their jobs. There's basic challenges for employers in how they build their business. And we've had a look at that, and I think what we've said is there is fundamentally a better way to, to, to manage that engagement. There's a better way to drive culture. There's a better way to have a more productive business. And, we get sort of classified as a HR company, we get classified as a performance company, we're not, we're a productivity company. And I think that's interesting with what Amazon's doing, what we're seeing with next generation applications. We suddenly have available to us an ability to solve simple problems. So, you know, coming back to key attributes, ruthless simplicity at an infrastructure and application level is just fundamental. And when, again, when we explain deputy, it's simple. We're solving basic problems. What do you need to know? What do you need to do? Where do you need to be as an employer or as an employee? It's nothing more complicated than that, but it's being done in a very complicated way today. Uh, Stuart, are you actually seeing, um, you know, you, you see a lot of startup com coming by, or, or uh, is, there a, is there a particular uh, uptake in, let's say, the productivity space? Yeah, we're, we're really focusing on you know, enhancing people's lives, making things uh, easier or, or more uh, sustainable for folks to actually live their lives. Yeah, I think that there, there, there certainly is, a, I guess, a, you know, anything you can create an app for these days, uh, you know, you, they're coming out. Um, you know, there's thousands of apps which are obviously, you know, sitting above and below effectively the fold on, uh, on the, the variety of app stores, whether it essentially is the Android store or the, the Apple store. Um, but I think that the opportunity to actually, I guess, uh, access data, access that data pervasively is, is really starting to drive it. So having the data available is, is, you know, essentially gives you that first step towards if you can measure it, then you can manage it, uh, bringing focus to those sorts of things, and uh, and then I guess it's the design experiences that are that are then laid on the top as to how much engagement actually occurs. And I guess yeah, they're the sort of things that we're really looking for as we uh, as we assess the uh, assess the opportunities. Um, for us, I guess we're always looking, I guess, at those platform plays, something which essentially uh, has the opportunity in the same way that, say, Amazon Web Services provides, to be that platform and to be available not just on a single instance, but on you know, as, as close as possible to a, a ubiquitous base. Now, that doesn't happen overnight, but you know, certainly we're looking for that sort of global vision, that, uh, that bullishness to say, you know, we're, we're willing to take on the world, uh, we know we've got a few steps to go. So. So, uh, Andrew, can we, can we um, maybe uh, talk a little bit about, let's say, the, the enterprise space? Um, uh, I like to believe that, that a number of years ago, there were hardly any, any startups that were directly targeting, let's say, the enterprise space. Yeah? Or, or at least, I mean, a smaller number. I like to believe that with the consumerization that we see in the enterprise space, that there's a lot more younger businesses actually targeting enterprises or trying to upset existing um, uh, forces in, in enterprises from the ground up with very simple new ideas. Um, is that something that, that you see happening as well? And is that something that you really would encourage? Yeah, absolutely. So ATP Innovations, next to this building is the incubator I work for. We have 50 startups in there, 300 people. 95% of them are targeting businesses as their, their customer. So, um, and we're broad brush, so life science, engineering, and IT. But uh, so absolutely, for me, so because my, ex my experience there is selling to businesses, so much simpler. So you save money for them or you make money for them. So the proposition of an application is, is simple. Co consumers, I don't understand. They're way too complicated. So in, in a sense, uh, you know, enterprise businesses are much easier to, to, uh, to, to pitch. Um, 
you, you have to you have to prove out the model. So yeah, yeah, but on the other hand, yeah. I'd like to believe that that was also using let's say the old style licensing models with you know big seats, the subscription numbers, and things like that. Uh, I'd like to believe that that the modern enterprise vendor has has uh, licensing models that are in line with let's say cloud uh, others. You know, um, a pay-as-you-go model, way more flexible terms for enterprises. Is that something that you see coming back in your startups? So, so I mean, for me, it's hard enough getting a product to market. So the business model, uh, if you need to sell two things to them, a new business model along with a new product, then you're giving yourself twice the challenge. Enterprises are now being trained to um, in the subscription service. Uh, and so, I mean, for our guys, really the recommendation is to follow whatever they're used to buying. Uh, and I, look, I think there are opportunity in, in evolving business models, but you know, creating a new one is, is uh, the role of so Apple and other people. So it's, you know, let them train corporates and then we'll sell. Okay. You know. So basically your advice to startups in the room would be to still stick with traditional business models? Or, all I'm saying is if you're selling to traditional people, <laughs> you need to sell traditional models. That's what, so don't double the challenge. Uh, okay. you know, so it, it, look, it depends, and we, we, we can create. Nathan, maybe uh, I think Nathan has an opinion on that. Yeah. No, I have an opinion on that. Yeah, I do. I mean, I come from a, a very large enterprise uh, business, and I mean, here's what happened. We'd go out and probably take about two years to sell you the product. Um, we'd probably take about two years to install it, so at this stage you're about four years into it, and then after about another year you'd probably decide you didn't like it and you'd go to the next vendor. I mean, that's it, right? Um, and in about 2008, when this started to change, again at an infrastructure level initially, the whole idea of what's now transpired turned absolutely everything upside down. We had to rethink our sales strategy, our consulting strategy, our marketing, our go-to-market, our product management, absolutely every part of our business. Um, and if you have a look at it today as advice, everything that you knew about that world doesn't, you know, is, is very rapidly changing. So this concept of just in time, this concept of immediate gratification, this concept that you have frictionless adoption is now what everybody wants. If you're in the enterprise space, you've spent 20 years getting screwed, right, by major vendors. And I'm saying this because I know I'm holding you all from drinks and I've got to keep you entertained, but that's what was going on. So you've got 20 years of, of, of companies going, we've had enough of that. So virtualization has been a huge ability to get enterprise application now, applications very quickly like ServiceNow, SolarWinds, there's some very large enterprise applications in that space. And I will admit, like Eric, I'll have a bit that a mea culpa. In 2008, with the company I, I was at, I voted not to buy SolarWinds. Uh, I didn't see how that could work in enterprise network management. I think they're doing about 150 million today, so not so smart. But everything's turned upside down. And when you're looking at startups, that whole idea of being on the edge and fundamentally innovative and different to everything you've known is how the game's getting played. And I can go back to oh, wait, we tracked Amazon where I was. We were very interested to see if anybody actually would use this stuff. Uh, we weren't convinced. But that was because we were coming from a large enterprise background. We look at it now, I'm the biggest advocate of Amazon because the ability, to, again, to be just in time, get what you need, move very fast, get instant gratification, have frictionless adoption, that's what the software world's about. And the other thing I would debate, there is no idea now or notion of enterprise software. There's problems that need to be solved and there will be products that solve them. It doesn't matter where in the world they are. It doesn't matter who's built them. If they solve a problem, you'll buy it because it's a very competitive world. I'll shut up. There's um, another question over there. Please, please do so. Uh, this question is to, uh, to Eric Rees. Eric, I'd um, like to hear your thoughts for, uh, for startups around um, conversion ratios and pricing strategies. In general? Yeah. Hi hypothetically speaking? What's your real question? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Uh, you should know entrepreneurs never ask hypothetical questions. So if you have a specific thing, if you don't mind talking about it in front of 5,000 people, what is it? No, my question really is that a lot of um, startups um, do exactly what you said, put a 10% you know, conversion figure in the, uh, in the, in the business plan and, and those sorts of things. Can you run the same level of testing around your pricing strategy as you can around your product strategy? Mm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yes, the answer is yes. And uh, like when we were building InView, 
we really had no idea what the pricing should be. You know, we were trying to sell people virtual goods, and, and that, now this is cool, but at the time, people thought this was, this was absolutely crazy. Um, or in America, they were like, they'd heard that it's happening in Asia, but they're like, Americans are not going to buy virtual clothes. It doesn't make sense. They didn't understand, because they, of course, everyone wants to jump to cultural differences instead of understanding the thing. So what's a virtual t-shirt worth? You know, is it, and we tried everything from, you know, we, we've tested prices across two orders of magnitude, right? Should it be 25 cents or $2.50 or $25? Really wasn't clear. So we tried all of those prices. And we, you know, just trying to understand what's the conversion rate. The nice thing about having a pathetically small number of customers is if you screw up, you can apologize. So, you know, when Amazon changes the pricing on people and does tests to test, charge different people different things, like that can, can be a huge issue. But when you have so few customers that you know all their names individually, <laughs> it's no big deal. If anyone's upset, you are like, oh, I'm so sorry, we'll make it right. So, so actually having that kind of small micro scale community is a great time to do that kind of testing and figure out. Um, I, I will say that none of these numbers m matters in isolation. So the other thing people get really focused on is, okay, I'm really curious about this conversion rate or this, you know, pricing or this lifetime value or this level of engagement. All the numbers have to add up together to produce a functioning business model. And uh, they, you know, they, they magnify together. So like we had a very specific belief about what the conversion rate that MVU had to be for us to be successful. And we had a very specific idea about the, what the lifetime value of a customer had to be. And it turned out that when we actually started measuring things, our conversion rates were a lot lower than we thought, but our lifetime value was a lot higher. So since those are two terms that get multiplied together in the business model, it doesn't actually matter the individual number. What matters is understanding how all the numbers work together and then saying, are we making the business model better as a whole uh, or not? And that's the kind of testing that's really important. And I also think that actually almost the communication to which the customer is there really helps a lot. When we um, when we did Amazon S3, the first service that, that we launched, uh, we actually didn't charge for request rates. I mean, to be honest, I mean, we were making up. Uh, <laughs> no, no, we, 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 had, we had a good pricing model. We knew what our resource costs were going to be. At least that's what, what we thought. We, we knew what kind of adoption we expected. Um, and we charged people for bandwidth and for storage. That seems like a reasonable thing to do for a storage system. Uh, it turns out that um, that works really well if files are large. It turns out one of our earliest customers uh, was one that uh, put thumbnails on eBay. Um, and he put millions and millions of thumbnails on eBay. Those thumbnails were a few bytes. Uh, so we had massive, massive request rates of no storage and no bandwidth. And it consumed an enormous amount of resources in, in, the, in, the, in our system. So we came to the realization that resources was another dimension over which we had to charge customers. And so we went to customers and said, um, sorry, but not necessarily that we screwed up, but we forgot something. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we then explained to customers that what we actually tried to do, we tried to absolutely drive the cost down for you, to price the cost down. But there is a dimension over which we have costs, that if you want this service to be uh, successful in the long term and continue to serve you, we will need to charge you over that dimension as well. Uh, customers said, okay. Uh, and that was the end of that story. And so I think honest communication there is definitely important. Um, I think beers up next, um, unfortunately. Um, I'll, um, oh no. <laughs> um, the, each of these gentlemen have been asked actually to give some parting thoughts in 140 characters. So I'll, uh, I'll, uh, they, they, it looks like they have forgotten this particular piece. Um, I'll, um, while they are thinking about that 140 characters, I've been asked what the story is behind the T-shirt. Yeah. So uh, one of our customers, actually, so this is a chaos monkey. Um, so uh, Netflix, one of our larger customers uh, uh, on, our, on our platform with a very, very widespread distributed architecture, uh, decided that they wanted to make sure that their environment was absolutely rock solid fault tolerant and that in no failure could actually bring their system down. So they built a software component called Chaos Monkey that randomly shoots down virtual machines um, and takes down databases. And um, uh, their idea is that if that happens, yeah, the whole system should continue to function. Yeah? Um, I thought that, that the Chaos Monkey is such when everybody, when they started talking about it, got a bit of a cult status. And, and um, uh, I think it is an accident 
uh, an excellent methodology to think about that you can build on the Amazon platform something that is so absolutely rock solid uh, and reliable that you can just kill off random components and it will just continue to work. Um, so I used 99 Designs, yeah, the, the local company, to actually tell, ask, uh, ask designers around the world, uh, design the chaos monkey, and um, as such, this is the t-shirt. So that was the story there. Yeah. Thanks, Netflix. Yeah. 140 characters. Okay. Oh, this is all you need to know. Ready? Think big, start small, scale fast. Only for one less. Yeah. Yeah, I like to do a bit of counting at times. <laughs> um, so for me, it's solving real problems for known customers that are going to pay you for it. Um, uh, we run a trading platform in the cloud. Your app will run just fine. Start your journey now. Okay. I'm a uh, big Springsteen fan, and if anyone saw South by Southwest this year, it was stay hard, stay hungry, stay alive. And uh, keep yourself out of the rain. Okay, fine. That was a... <laughs> if you're passionate about something, test it. Create a movement around yourself. Commit to it fully and just get stuff done. Okay. With that, um, uh, thanks to the panel. I think there's been a, um, the tweets that I saw coming by. Is everybody is very grateful for your insights that you gave today? Um, there also were quite a few tweets that, that asked that, that um, as I say, uh, um, thanked everybody on the panel for promoting actually uh, uh, local businesses in, in, the, in, the, in the region. I think uh, people feel very strongly about that. Um, I think from an Amazon point of view, uh, we're really grateful that we are allowed to talk uh, both on one hand on our services and I, I'm pretty sure that Eric is also um, very happy that, that you guys are willing to listen to the message here. Um, for us, it is all about you. Yeah? For Amazon, we want to be the Earth's most customer-centered company and that goes for our cloud business just as well. Yeah? We will continue to listen to you. This is the most important. Fill in your feedback forms online because that actually gives us feedback uh, about this conference. But please be vocal uh, about reasons uh, why you might not want to use Amazon Web Services. Uh, what are the kind of obstacles that you see if you are using them? Be really brutal and open and honest towards our, our account managers to give us feedback because we need that. Without that, we are not making our products better. And so, uh, thank you very much for your efforts to come here, to spend the day with us, and uh, uh, is it um, work hard, uh, make history, have fun. Thank you.